Well, welcome to the February 2022 Granite State Wood Turners uh, demonstration and meeting. We've been trying hard to meet every month, even with COVID. Uh, we're doing it live now uh, to some degree, but uh, delighted to have you all here with us. Um, administrative announcements um, through the door, and the first door on the right is the uh, a restroom feel free to use it if you need a glass of water there are cups in there and this it's good clean well water coming up from the uh, from the well um, other than that I think you can see and see and do whatever you need uh, our next meeting will be the fourth Saturday and Wednesday and it's going to be zoom only but um, uh, John Siegel who's an incredible spindle turner has put together a spindle turning basics um, program. It's been pre-recorded, but he's going to narrate it as he goes. We'll be able to stop and uh, interact it uh, along the way. So it's kind of like a live demo, but a little protection by being pre-recorded. Um, our group has a board of directors. That's a lofty title for the, the planning gang. Um, We'll be trying to put together a slate of officers for next year over the next couple of months. And I want you all to know that you're more than welcome to uh, participate in that. Anybody who's interested in joining the, the planning committee, being a director, uh, would, you know, give me a call. There's a, there are handouts on the side that have got my contact information and, and we'll, we'll note your interest and get you involved as best we can. Um, it's a lot of fun. We've got a good group of people doing it now. We enjoy our meetings. We meet once a month by Zoom and then conduct these meetings. So the workload is not onerous and it is it's an interesting and fun thing to do. So uh, please give it some consideration. Anything else to come before the group of a general nature? All right, we, we did some uh, board to a, or log to bowl discussions back in uh, July and this is going to be a repeat of some of that but in a little more depth uh, a little less talking and, and, and some demonstration of the different steps I think uh, in July we may have kind of fire hosed some people and uh, say what did they say so we're gonna go through it again and, uh, and kind of emphasize it let me read a quote here from uh, Don McIver from his article, the Green, uh, From Green Blank to Lathe. The step between learning to turn and beginning to acquire a wood stash is a short one. Gain a little confidence at the lathe and your eye will soon start wandering to dead trees and downed limbs and the distant sound of a chainsaw will have you salivating like Pavlov's pooches. Without a bit of preparation, you can also set yourself on the road to heartbreak as you discover your wood hoard splitting itself into firewood. So what we're trying to cover today is how to minimize the amount of your wood that goes into firewood and the amount that actually turns into a product and does something useful for you. So let me start. There's, there's two kinds of wood that we turners find ourselves encountering. I'll divide them into store-bought and not store-bought. I'm avoiding the word free because there's no such thing. Uh, the, the amount of work and effort and material and stuff you're going to pour into producing uh, these free bowl blanks uh, is not insignificant. So let's, let's just kind of look at the two a little bit. In the store-bought category, uh, there's a kiln-dried board. And it was four times that length when I picked it up at Goose Bay a couple months ago. I happened to need a piece to do a, a, a wedding gift. And it was about 120 bucks. I got four of these out of it. Two are going to become uh, tabletops, and the other two are going to become. One has become a bowl, and this one will become a bowl. Okay, so you're looking at twenty-five, thirty dollars for something like that. That adds up quickly, because I'm sure a lot of you get prolific. You turn out two or three in a weekend, and doing that every weekend, that price really adds up. So cost is a factor. So one way you get it, kiln dried, and 
plain old board. Here's a similar piece. This is already cut round. This comes from Rockler. Um, nice piece of figured maple. Um, $51 minus the guild discount. Not insignificant, right? And still, you notice, I don't have a whole lot of thickness. If I wanted to do something big, which is what I like to do, I like the bigger the better. I'm not up to Stephen Hogbin yet. He's the guy that got me started years ago. He has a, his lathe is in a barn powered by a six-cylinder Ford engine. <laughs> and he turns things big enough, he can cut them in quarters and make four chairs. Uh, here's about the biggest one I've done. Got this up the street, a piece of tamarack. And uh, cost me 20 bucks for two of these. It was the butt of a tree, sawed them in half. I brought them home, dried them out, and made a couple of bowls. Uh, you can see this one has got some cracking problems. I'm not sure how I'm going to finish this one. It's already, it was once turned, I started the, the second turning, and hear this pop as it breaks apart. So that's the kind of things you run into with some of this stuff. It's not as stable as a kiln-dried piece. But I can't imagine going to Goose Bay, and certainly not to Highland Hardwoods, and getting a chunk like this. Okay, three, four, five inches, and that's about it. Other ways that you buy store-bought wood. Let's see, here's a piece from uh, Goose Bay. The first piece I bought from them caused me a considerable disappointment. Not because there was anything wrong with it, but because I didn't understand it. It came completely coated in paraffin. Okay, which means the wood inside could be as wet as the day it was cut. It's not going to dry very fast with that, that paraffin. It does eventually dry. When I buy wood like this, typically I just take a card scraper and I take the paraffin off of the side, the four sides, leave the ends coated. Uh, this piece has been done that way and it's, it's getting about ready to turn. But if you're going to buy it with the idea of turning immediately, like I did with this piece, this was a piece of olive wood. It was three times this long. And I wanted to make a, a mortar and pestle like I saw on the cover of the AAW magazine. Son of a gun, and here it's all wrapped in paraffin and it was soaking wet. I managed to get, get away with making one. I've since made the second. This one is now perfectly dry, but it's a couple years later. Now, price is a factor. It was 85 bucks for the three pieces plus a, a two by two to make the pestles with. So it, it really adds up, and you don't want to be doing a lot of that. About 10% of what I do is with store bought wood, and most of the rest is with found wood that's been labored over. So, what's the difference between store bought? and the, the stuff you're going to process at the expense of your body and time and equipment. Availability, uh, convenience, and, uh, and cost. It's going to cost you a lot more to buy it. You're going to save considerable money doing it this way. Availability, there's no way you're going to find a, a zebra wood or a coco bolo tree in my backyard. I can get domestics easily, as, as all of us can, but uh, so, so availability and then the convenience. You want to make something right away? There you go. So from a log to a bowl. Here's a couple of examples of logs right here. I got these from Ron at the uh, uh, July meeting, I believe it was. and. Annie. <laughs> this is where you're probably going to start. If you're out in your yard cutting or if you, your neighbor offers you a tree or something. Now, these are big. They're about 22 inches across here. Ron cut them about 17 inches high. So the added width isn't really there. The biggest I could get out of it is about 17 inches because of, of the length. Ideally, when you're doing this, you'd like to cut it so that the length is 50% longer than the diameter. Because no matter how well you seal it and whatnot, you're going to get some end checking moving in. And so if you cut it 50% longer, uh, those checks probably aren't going to get into the heart that you want to turn into a bowl. Now, if Ron had left this 50% longer, 
he and I and two of you probably couldn't have picked it up by ourselves. <laughs> it was heavy enough when it was wet, just like this. So that's a consideration. And these, these are pretty good size diameter. Um, I got four of them from Ron. One I got this out of and two or three other small pieces because it had a couple of big cracks in it. Now this one looks a little odd in shape. I was aiming to do something like this with it, uh, which I will. It's been once turned and, and I think it'll come up about like this and then I'll redo this and try to get it right. That was This is my experiment. The other, the other one that I've done already, there were a total of four, turns out like this. I, I cord it to make some extra, so I've got a one, two, and three. This one here is about uh, 13, almost 14 inches. So that's, that's three nice pieces out of one of these. That's a whole lot less than this. It wasn't that much work. I mean, Ron did the, the heavy lifting to get the, the basic billets uh, put together. And I probably spent an hour and a half getting these out and sealed. So, the, the first basis is go to these half logs. And you can see these two are cut in half. They're too heavy to do much with. The, the first thing you're doing is taking your chainsaw and cutting down through the pith. Now I can't tell for sure here whether Ron took a, a core out or, or just a single cut. You can do a single cut in the pith. If, if you mark the pith on one end and on the other, uh, we're going to skip the chainsaw demo because it's too cold out and the logs out there are frozen. So the one thing I want to leave you with here is when you're cutting those in half, do it this way cut along the length of the log. It's going to give you long, thin shavings that are going to go spitting out of there. Uh, it may clog your, your bar a little bit, but I find it works well. If you try to do it the other way, if you're coming straight down like this, you're getting, getting little shavings, you're fighting the end grain. Saw is not done. It's not really designed for that, so put it this way and it, it'll work great. Uh, Safety, if you've not used a chainsaw before, that's a whole different course. These things can maim you, <laughs> so I want to be sure you understand that just picking them up and going is probably not a good idea. But they're a lot of fun. And you can fell trees, and often, many of you have done that. I don't know what your levels of expertise are. So, first step, cut it down. I don't know if you can see from there, this, this has been sealed with, uh, looks like a latex paint. Because um, you want to seal the end grain, you want to slow the flow of moisture out the end. Um, anyway, I'm going to put this into a more chewable chunk here in a second. Think about your firewood pile, because your turning wood and your firewood are about the same thing. And I got to thinking about that because, as I told you in the, in the intro, I'm going to show you mistakes as well as successes. Because that heartbreak that he was talking about in the article is true, and I can show you as many mistakes around here as I can successes. So hopefully we'll, we'll help uh, steer you away from some of that. If you're going to stack your firewood, you start by putting something under it. If you're just laying it in the dirt, you know that that bottom layer is getting bugs and moisture and rot and gnarly. I usually put mine onto concrete blocks, which is some help. Still get some bugs and some rot. Then you stack it so that the air can get around it. You've cut it to the size you have in mind for your fireplace, so which is your target size. And then you stack it and the air gets in and out of it. And then on top, you put some kind of a cover so the rain doesn't get directly on it. You don't worry too much about a little bit of wetness and whatnot. And you're not worried about that wood because it's going in the fireplace. If it checks and cracks and whatnot. But the basics of keeping the rot out, keeping the weather out are it's neatly stacked, the air can get at it, and uh, the water is not gonna come and re-soak it every time it rains. Now for your turning wood, 
You're going to do all of that, but in addition, you want to control the tension in the wood and the moisture leaving the wood. Those two become very important to you. They don't matter to the firewood much. If it's got tension, if it uh, dries fast, no big deal. With your turning stock, that'll matter a lot. So in controlling the tension, the first thing you're doing is, is you're cutting it down to the pith. How can I best show this? Maybe with this guy. Look at him rock. What's happened here, th this is a fairly dry piece of wood. You can see that it's thicker here than here. It's begun to, to fold up because that's what wood does. By splitting it down the center here, that's allowed it to do this. And it's helping to prevent cracking here because it can fold up like a fan. And it'll, it'll get like this, it'll, it'll, it'll rock. So that's the first thing is taking the tension out. The second thing is coating the end grain with some kind of a product. When I'm outdoors, I usually just use latex paint or, or primer. It's cheap, it's usually left over from some other projects, so it's, it's virtually free. Uh, there are a variety of products available to do it. One of the better known ones is Anchor Seal. This stuff is $50, $55 a gallon. I use it indoors because it dries clear. I can see what's going on with the wood. I don't use that much of it, and uh, so I, I do have some. Another product is called Tree Saver. This is a PVA-based product, very similar to glue. In fact, Ron uses school glue, and I think he dilutes it. Okay, and that, that's a, even less expensive. This stuff is running twenty dollars a gallon, and school glue. I think he said he paid twelve and seven, seven <laughs> for a gallon. So there you go. That's a great way to do it. Or the latex paint. That's about all that's worth mentioning there. Now, in the mistake department, okay, this particular log was a nice piece of maple. And I got it at a sawmill down the street, guy with a band sawmill. And so instead of cutting him 50% of diameter, I had him take the band sawmill and go right through the core of the tree, right down the pith, and give me half logs, about eight feet long. About this, this, some of them were almost this big. And because I've got forks on the tractor, I stacked them back out here on concrete blocks. So my wood pile suddenly is these big long ones. Why mess around and have to paint the ends of 10 pieces? Well, all I gotta do is paint two ends. And okay, there we go. And from that pile, I've made a lot of pretty good stuff. Here's, here's one first turn bowl. You can see there's spalting in it. It's nice, it's good solid wood. Uh, I'm not seeing much white rot. I made this piece out of that same log. This was for an article we did in the, in the Guild magazine a while back. Again, the spalding is neat. Got a number of really nice pieces out of that. But I left some of the rest of them out there. And unlike my wood pile, my firewood pile, I covered them with a tarp, clear around them. Now the ends were open, but remember all the ends were painted. And it's been sitting out there now for two years. So on Monday, in preparation for this, I said, well, let's bring that in and see how that fits in. Well, son of a gun, this piece was probably about this long. I cut the ends off and saw that there was no checking. There was a little checking when I started. They'd take off an inch, take off another inch. So I finally took the piece that was left, cut it in half, and brought in these two pieces. So we're sure from the same side of the log. Stuck this one in the lathe. Well, sitting there with not enough air circulation, because that tarp was down close on them, buttoned down against the wind, this darn thing has turned largely into white rot. Now, when I, I cut away the inner side here, I've still got some fairly decent wood here. Uh, right now, this whole tenon is going to be gone. This is going to be a much smaller piece. And even around the perimeter, which doesn't need this plastic on it anymore, 
I tend to put that plastic on, and I would advise you to do it only for brief periods. I'll show you some other pieces that that's just too much. There's nothing getting out of there. But I still got a lot of white and rotten stuff here, so I don't know if this is going to end up with a bowl or a firewood. Probably not even good for firewood because it's got a lot of mass. So the message there is uh, don't leave it completely covered. Okay, I've got a couple of piles out here that are pretty checked up. I did them properly. I cut them over length, and sealed them, and stacked them. But I let the sunlight come in. This, this is west out here. And all afternoon, that hot sun would come in and bake one into those logs. So after a year or so, when I started trying to do something with them, a lot of uh, checking had occurred because of that temperature differential. So I'll be changing the firewood pile to block the sun so that the, the turning squares in there don't, don't get direct sun. Um, after six months or a year, it's not a bad idea to bring them indoors. I've had the very best luck over the last 40 years with this approach. Cut them 50% over, cut them down the pith, and seal them, let them dry outside for a while, and then bring them in. And uh, I've had almost 100% success. But you've got to be patient. Wood dries at a rate of about one inch, uh, or, or one year per inch. So if, if you've got, uh, here's 10 inches, that's not all 10 inches, so let's, let's, let's call this equivalent to six. That's about six years for this to be completely dried, even after you've brought it into the shop. Now I find that in here, this shop is pretty dry. I have no moisture problems in here. And our stuff dries faster than that year per inch once it's indoors. But you, again, you gotta watch that, because if it's coming out the ends and this checking starts, you know, you've ended up with firewood again. Okay. Good question, Ray. Yes. Is there any benefit to taking two or three inches off the bark side of that to help facilitate drying? As well as putting it down the tip? Okay, uh, Bill is asking if there's any benefit to taking something off on the bark side and keeping it as a slab. And I'm going to give you a guess, Bill, because I've got the same question. My guess is there is some benefit to that. Um, for one thing, you're reducing the effective width of it. You're letting it dry from both sides. Um, I haven't done much of that. Typically when I do that is just before I put it on the bandsaw. Sometimes before I bring it in, I'll, I'll take the chainsaw, and I, I can cut them into hex hexagons, take a piece off. It gets rid of some of the weight, so I'm not killing myself lugging it in here. So I've had somebody get on that bandsaw. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. Uh, but yeah, I think that's probably a worthy thing to do. I got, I'm gonna mention something. It, yeah, please. It all depends on how you store the wood. Okay, if, if you've got it so it's not getting direct sunlight and heat and whatnot and limited air movement, it's fantastic. But if you get a lot of air, uh, air movement, a lot of sunlight and stuff, it's going to check on those open faces. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, the ce ceiling is some help. It's not perfect. This particular piece, it's got a pretty good split coming in here, kind of a ring, ring check. Um, of the other two pieces, one had a big check, one was clean. So that was 50% of them. Now uh, these, these are now been down for I don't know how long they were down when when I got them from Ron in July, but probably probably four years. Oh really? Okay. There's still plenty of moisture in them. Yeah, yeah that's uh, mist tints from Walmart or Home Depot in the several coats. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's another good point. You coat it once. You may want to go check up on it because in time you'll see it opening up, and it's a good idea. Latex is easy, slather some more on there. This is showing me 14%, and that's just through the end. Inside it'll be a little more. And that's that's been in this shop for six months. It's been sitting right here where I'm standing. Uh, and I ran out of steam from the first two. But then these two, which came in on Monday, are pretty much garbage. What do you got on this end? 
I told you when I brought it in, I had no visible checking. It was in the shop for a day, and you can see considerable checking on there already. And uh, so I may not even bother trying this one. I don't know, there's just too, too much there. Did you just cut the ends on that? Or? Well, this arrived as an eight-footer cut through the pith with a bandsaw. The, the, a lot of stuff was cut, brought in, turned, allowed to spalt, but came out pretty nice. This last bit was sitting with the tarp right over it in the center of a dry pile, and it got too dry and was able to go ahead and rot, and that's too bad. Lesson learned on that. Okay. Other questions at this stage? Would you be better off, like that piece you just had, that eight foot piece that you had split down the center, if you had kept that as a log and just painted the end, and then when you needed or wanted a piece, you'd take off a two foot section, repaint that cut, and then store that as a log. I know it's not going to dry. Yeah. So yeah. Like well, I've got two out here back here now that I didn't think I was going to take any more wood. As you can see, I got more wood than I probably turned in my lifetime. So I'd about decided, well, enough of this with your tired old body. Well, I got a call from the neighbor in October. He said, would you bring the tractor over and help me with this pear tree? Pear tree, okay, fine. Well, I get over there. This pear tree he'd had growing over there for 40 years. It had two trunks that were about 16 inches at the base and 16 feet long. And he didn't want the wood, particularly. It was too much cutting and splitting for him. So they got loaded on the forks of my tractor. They're now parked on concrete blocks out back. And we're going to go through some of those uh, here in just a minute. Use those for our demonstration for today. But uh, I'm keeping them in log length. I'll talk to that more as we go through because there are some issues and especially with fruit wood is uh, very prone to checking and cracking. So I've, I've picked about the hardest uh, available to <laughs> try this project. Uh, other questions or thought as far as storage outside, chainsawing, outdoor processing? Uh, I'm going to mention uh, one thing or two. Um, I use I've used a lot of stuff to seal the ends of wood. I've reverted to PVA glue, polyvinyl acetate glue, Elmer's glue, school mm -hmm. glue. And I used to put two, three coats on. But I sent, I use brown masking paper like you see at the old butcher shop and whatnot. So yeah. I put the PVA glue on, then I put the paper on. And if I can keep that from getting wet and whatnot, I've had tremendous success as far as that sealing it, but not like plastic where it where it actually caused mold and stuff. Because I've done this PVA glue and plastic, and that's not the, <laughs> the way to go. You know, the bi the biggest thing with with wood is to let air breathe. Okay, mm -hmm. but don't let it get moisture from the ground. Don't let it get moisture from above. So, no. you know. So you're using the PVA outdoors as well? Well, I've got, I, that walnut that I just got, I cut all the pieces of the great big crates that I have, the, the metal crates that mm -hmm. tubs come in. Yeah. And I put PVA glue, paper, and then I got some, uh, a covering on there, metal old metal roofing covering on there that extends both ways. And okay. That's outside, and I'm I'm part of that. Good. Part. So that kind of follows the the analogy of your firewood pile. You've got something above it to keep the rain from coming down, but you still got air circulation. Because if you want it to dry, you got to have air circulation. If you want it to spalt, you want to keep it a little moist, but don't overdo it because here's an example of what would have been great spalted maple is turned into just white rot. I'll also move those crates behind my house because it gets shade from trees and mm -hmm. whatnot, and so it's not getting tremendous amount of sun and heat and whatnot. So. Yeah, good. 
Well, Ron operates on a much larger scale than most of us would likely do, but the same process works in whatever scale suits you. Yes, please. So how about uh, in like a barn, an open barn? Is that a, perfect? Is that yeah, good yeah, or, yeah. Okay, yeah. absolutely perfect. I just know how much wind, you know, the yeah. air has to go through. If it's a, you know, open one-sided barn, is that... Yeah, even a, even a closed barn's got enough air volume. Okay. I, you know, I when I have a plastic plastic garage that's outside of my garage door. Yeah. That's filled with ball blanks. They've all been sealed and whatnot. And actually, Annie got some out of that. Yeah. And you leave Annie, the door open on that, right? Uh, no, no. No, you close it up. It, it's closed, okay. but it, it gets to breathe and whatnot. All right. Well, I had started turning back in the 70s and uh, messed around and did, did more than I realized when I looked back on it uh, and then quit for well, something over 30 years. And But I had learned this process way back and I had stashed some stuff together. It was sitting around this shop. I had about a dozen pieces, a little smaller than this, sitting here all in, sealed, cozy, 30 years dry. <laughs> And they're gathering dust in my shop. I'm thinking, well, I've got to turn these into something. Let's quit messing around. Let's turn them into something. So I started on my little Delta lathe, and the slowest speed was 950. I get a gnarly thing that would fit over that six inch swing lathe, and the lathe is walking around. So that lathe's gone. This lathe came in. My flat work quit, and all I've done is turn for the last three years. And. Uh, but those 12 pieces of wood, some elm, some cedar, uh, some butternut, were all perfect. I had no problem with any of them. They had, they had all uh, developed that little rock of a little bit here, uh, but no end checking or anything. So the, by far the best success I've had is with those. And those were stored in a barn in a property I owned over in Nashua. I just, just left there. Okay. Can you offer any wisdom about developing sources of wood in your neighborhood in your, in your region of the state? Yeah, well, like he said here, you, you know, you start to hear a distant chainsaw and you're salivating for this and that. Arborous. Yeah. yeah. Arborous is, is your best source, especially if you have make them a bowl and they'll keep bringing you stuff and they get a lot of variety. How long do you kill your decoy? Yeah, yeah. One thing I do is and you're driving around, and I, if I see a tree down in, in Rick's yard here, I stop and go, hey, what are you doing with that piece of wood? Yeah, let me help <laughs> you with that. Is, no, you can't have it, but I've, every time I've told somebody I'm a wood turner, oh, help yourself. Yeah. So yeah. I'll take a piece that I'll get something out of, and then because it's a maybe unique piece of wood, I have a piece, and I also make that person a piece. Yeah. And they are so thankful when you give them something that yeah. came from their property. I got about five of those trees in my yard again. Yeah. Yeah. So that when I first started seeing wood appear, it would appear on both sides at the same time. And I missed that step. Good point, John. Okay. Go a little deeper. I'm trying to leave some stuff here, and it's partly because if I forget that I'm between centers, instead of like right now I'm on the woodworm chuck, if I'm between centers and I let this get too narrow, I run the risk of it breaking off, especially there's still a little bit of bark involved here and stuff like that. In this case, I'm just using tailstock support so I could take it clear off without too much issue, but uh, I just always try to be careful as I get down there narrower and narrower that suddenly this is going to be not in the act anymore. So who can 
tell me what direction my whoops my bevel is pointing. This is a test question. Who's paying attention? There's a cut. Okay. Again, it's still straight this direction. It's, it's exactly parallel. Okay. I can't cut this way. So as I'm making these cuts, I'm gliding this bevel along that fixed edge, and it's not going to come in this direction because it can't. Okay, and then I'm cutting by rotating, lowering the handle, and presenting a 45 degree angle with the flute against this face. And we're getting closer, except like Jim said, I really did screw up with that. <laughs> All right, so let's... So I better uh, damp, damp it a little bit. So I'm using the left hand to damp vibrations. I'm trying hard not to make the left hand control. Otherwise, I'm going to get harmonics and it's going to bounce. And, and then the other thing is I'm getting close to this end. And you can see it is chipping out a little bit now. I'm using this hand as a brake. So I can keep good tension because I'm using my big muscles going forward and this can kind of help retract it so that, it, that I can still be smooth and yet not break through too fast. So it, it's, it's a break. I'm usually avoiding rubbing on the, on the rest because I, I want the control all to be right here at this point. That's, that's what's going to determine where it is. You know, with a lot of other cutting methods, you end up with your finger running here, you're trying to keep your depth adjusted that way uh, with a push cut that's really not quite right now I've still got bark here and so now I got to strike the right balance between the hundred millimeters I need on the tenon and having enough room here left once I get that bark off of there so I think I'm going to go just a little bit deeper and then I'm going to take that off and we'll have the outside I, I can't hear you, Gary. Can you make the tenon a little bit bigger so that you have a little room left? Good, good point. What they'll tell you on these chucks is, if I got one handy here, your best dimension is so that the thing almost closes on the tenon. That way you've got everything in there. If you're out of ways, which brand have I got here? When these were cut apart, there we go. whatever tool they used left a gap something like that. So when you get this tightened onto your tenon, if it's about like that, you've got the strongest possible hold. <coughs> but in this case, we're... <coughs> Excuse me. We're turning wet. <coughs> I think I'm okay. This one's now dry. You can see it's wider here than here. Hmm. So, uh, it'll go away in a sec. So, to Gary's point, I have set the these calipers I, I have a go-no-go -no -go gauge like this. It's got the tenon on one side and the uh, recess on the other and it shows the max and the min. In this case I'm using a tenon so I'm going to try to make this about the max. I want to get it 
just small enough that it'll fit in there without too much hassle. It's not the strongest way, but it means that after it dries and it becomes oval, it's going to be smaller when I cut it back around, which we'll do in a minute. So I'm, I'm sacrificing a little bit of hold, but I'm going to have more than enough on this particular piece because it's, it's wet. Wet would cut so much easier than dry. And by the time it's dry, I'll cut that round and we'll be there. Okay. Do you consider using a smaller chuck for that size? Or? Yeah. I use two standard sizes most of the time, a 100 millimeter and a 70. I could switch to a 70, I suppose. Because of the black inclusion there, yeah. Well, you pointed out the fatal error. That if I had seen that, I'd have been a little bit better off. Because this would have been gone by now, and the bowl would be at least this size. But it's a demo, so we'll go with what we got. You design on the fly. Exactly. You always design on the fly, right? I think I'm going to go just a little deeper with that then take that bark and we'll call it quits. Usually if I leave too much junk in this first turn bowl, I regret it later because it'll end up being exactly where I don't want it. Uh, the, this In this case, the bark is toward the side. So as this dries, it's going to get shrink in this direction, but not in this direction. This dimension out here on the long grain is going to stay pretty much where it is. This is going to shrink by a few percent. And the wetter the bowl is when you do it, the more it's going to shrink. Uh, probably leave a little bit of that on there. It doesn't. It looks pretty solid. Okay. in my way. That's why I'm getting those catches. Let's call that a day. Okay, I think we'll be good. All right. typically use a skew so the angle is about what I want and I try to be sure that I'm making the bottom of the bowl concave a little bit, a couple of degrees. 
because when I clamp it in the chuck, I want the outer edge of the jaws to be in contact with the wood. That's where the strength is. If I do it the other way, where the, it's the inside of the jaws that contact it, it's going to create a stress point and I'm going to have to lose that tenon. So I'm always trying to be sure I've got a little bit there. I've got extra diameter right now. And I'm just going to send that in there at a better angle. Now just take a look. I'm gripping a little bit on bark, but I think I can get away with it. And I am sufficiently concave. I think it's still a little bit large. Not bad. I'll just take a hair off. It's always embarrassing to turn it around and then take a you got to put it back on a super wood one. Okay, so I've got a taper on it that's approximately the same taper as the inside of the jaws. I've got a depth that will fit completely in the jaws without bottoming out. And I think I'll just take that nub off and this phase will be complete. I'll take this out of the way. I like that I've got storage right here, so I've usually got two or three live centers right there ready to go. I get tired of manhandling 40 pounds on and off of there all the time, so the swing away has earned its keep. The magnet's strong enough that that doesn't usually come flying open. And then I can get to this end. Oops. And take that guy off of there. still see where the center is right now. I'm going to put a little dot on it because when it's time to turn this final, that becomes the only clear reference you got. Everything else has changed in shape, but that will still be the center of where you started. And that's what you're going to want to be able to use to index it and, and get it round without losing too much. I use a skew and do a little dimple. Oh, okay. And it's perfect center. All right, there you go. There you go. Okay. Now, stop and remember what we're doing here. We're trying to get a first turn bowl. I want, this is going to establish pretty much what the shape is going to be later, because you're, you're having to make your decision now, because later on when you're turning it, you've set some parameters. So, uh, I'll just try to give it a little shape here and That'll finish the outside. And we can get a little. I'm switching to another gouge. It's the same same 40-40 elliptical. It's just a little smaller. Cuts a little cleaner. Oh, come on. 
right about here. Where else take this out of here? Okay. If I was final turning, I'd be kind of worried about getting the speed up a little higher, sharpen this thing just that little extra bit uh, before making that final cut. And I'd be trying to get that final cut in one continuous sweep, which is possible with a push cut if you don't have the tail stock or clawed in the way. You get over here and you bring it on around. And, uh, take a little bit more than you think, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch. You take a quarter, you're going to get some tear out, but for a, for a first turn bowl, I've got some ridges on here. I don't have much tear out. I'm going to lose some at the top where that little pith is acting like the chip in your windshield. But if I've made that right size, I think I'm good. Because I'll be very embarrassed if I turn it around and I have to, it won't fit. All right, put that puppy out of the way. Yes, yeah, sir. On the, uh, just put your opinion on You're trying to be sitting with the drive. Do you have a round with sharp corners? Are those the corners are? Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. All of those I would round. You'll see all of those are rounded over there. Because that sharp edge will act as a concentration. You're going to lose it anyway, so don't be stingy. Now, I'm always trying not to waste the least millimeter of wood, and that ends up costing me big time in the long run. Okay, so I think this outside is okay. There is a little tear out there, but it won't hurt anything. So, I think we're ready. Now, I don't have the set screws in this chuck, so I'll just put a wrench on it. There we go. Bowls this size, I can usually get off by hand. Smaller ones, sometimes uh, I got my handy dandy pipe wrench over here. This little strap. If I've got the set screws set, which screws up the quill, you know, I can do it without the wrench, but. I like to keep a hand under it, but I also want to be aware when that weight suddenly shifts, I don't want it to bang me against the ground. 18 inch bowl can make your fingers smart. This, this one, not so much. Okay. Now I've got mostly Nova chucks. And they're, they're okay. I, I'm not wild about Nova. I think Record Power I like a little better as a company. But they're decent. And one thing I do like is they've got a lot of accessories. And in the case of this uh, 100 millimeter, I can put this in. I don't have to take the chuck off. That's why I was sticking with 100, because I want to do everything with the one chuck. I, don't, I mean, I could switch back and forth. You've always got the wrong jaws. You're spending way too much time on an Allen wrench. Not enough time on your skew. I've also got a stem center that will fit in this same thing, and there's other centers you can get. And there's rings that go on there, which we'll see in a bit, because when I go to this, uh, what I'm going to call a jam chuck, this fits right on the same hundred with this ring. I could have done it with a turned recess, but that's a convenience. So if I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff in about the same size range, I'm not taking that chuck off, I'm not changing jaws, I'm not messing around. 
So let's open these puppies all the way up. Let's see if we got away with it. Yep. Oh. Is that okay? This zipper doesn't lend itself to fasten it in the center. All right, all right done. Okay. Usually, if I got, especially if I got a big ball, I make sure I'm putting pressure at the top because that's keeping that top in. I let the weight pull the bottom in. I give it a turn, snug it. I got plenty of room now. I go around and snug the other one. And it moves quite a bit. And I come back and do this guy. It's still moving, especially with wet wood. Okay. So that should be pretty secure. If I look at it here, I can see that the outer ridge of the jaws is touching the wood. I can see a little gap on the inner edge and a little bit of a gap on the um, uh, the dovetail, but that shouldn't be a problem. So I think I'm, I'm pretty solid there. Okay, I've already finished the outside for a first turn. I'd fuss with it a lot more if this was the final. Go ahead and come back with this guy. We'll here. There's some clearance. There we are. I'm going to set it a little bit below center about half the width of the tool. I guess I'll stay with this tool. Set that. Spin it make there, sure everything's good. Turn it down a little bit just for grins. Okay, we're good. Okay, so now I'm, I'm gripped in the jaws solidly, but I don't, I don't have any tail support and I don't really need it. I'm gonna need a little swing room. Okay. Now it's got that hole going in about uh, seven eighths of an inch, which is kind of handy for the center here. But I just do an ent entry cut. I want that going straight in. And I'll roll it around. chatter was caused because you've got the, the core of the tree right around the pith is a different density than the stuff out here so I'm getting a little bit of that same there's no air gap in there but so usually I start by just making a, a indent here in the middle some guys will take a drill bit and drill to final depth I'm a little lazy for that I've played with it but I haven't found that little center nub to be a big problem so I generally just go like this so once I've created that, uh, it's not as important on a first turn like this, but I'm going to do, the, do it the regular way anyway. I'm going to start by taking my gouge, and I'm still going to put that point pointing straight in. Okay, so that's the direction of cut is that 40 degrees that I've preset by grinding the tool. And I'm just going to go in repeatedly until I get out toward the edge. And... Uh, I'm only going to go in maybe a third to a half of the way because on a finished piece I'd be worried about vibration. In fact, there's a piece I ought to do here. I got a bad check here, so I guess I better start by just taking some of this face off because we're going to lose it. cheating with my left hand.
still cutting now. So I've still got another good quarter of an inch before I get past that check. And there's not much you can do about that puppy, so. right here if, if you've got the face a little too open or closed or your angle is off it's going to want to skate so to make an entry cut I want to have pressure on this side of it I want to have that as normal to this as possible with the face completely closed that is meaning pointing horizontally and once it gets started then I'll increase it and, and cut in Let me embarrass myself. See, once it gets started, there's a little edge. That bevel is against it. It's not going that way anymore. I don't have to worry about it. Again, you can see the vibration starting from that variable density in the wood. Be patient. All right, now I'm getting a little edge. All right, should be good. Roll it. Drop the handle. I'm, I'm trying to get 45 degrees on the flute. which right now doesn't do much harm. If I was out near the, the rim, I'd be kicking myself because I'd been garbaging up the rim. In fact, when I'm out near the rim, I usually cut a little bit of taper on it so that it's, it's getting a little narrower. And that makes the entry cut a little bit uh, less critical. Plus, I like the inside to taper in. That's just the way I typically do my bowls. So.
On the inside of a bowl, I sometimes have to watch this because I usually only do it finger tight. Now on the inside of the bowl, it'll tend to want to unwind. If it's problematic, I can come over here to the bench wrench and just give it a little tweak. But uh, usually I just go with hand tight. Make sure that none of that vibration is coming from. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you can set it for the video, it's fine, I can see, okay. It was a little dark there, I was wondering, what's up? <laughs> okay. Oh, it may, may be the end of that. Looks, looks like I owe you a light. No, I doubt it. <laughs> It's an LED, so it should have. It's hard to beat green turning and you get these. Huh? These are moist, but they're not soggy. When I did those other ones, I had liquid water running down the flute. I thought that might happen. It was my wall was getting thin here. Oh, I've got about nine and a half inches. So I'm going to stay a little under an inch here probably for the wall thickness. I'm not trying to set that up. It's false economy to skimp at this point. The drying time for one inch or an inch and a quarter isn't going to be much different. And if the shrinkage is great, okay, because when you return it, you know, you're going to be taking some off of the outside here and some off of the inside here. And you're hopefully you're going to have enough rim left when you're done. So this oval is going to get round again. So leave yourself enough. The thickness is less important than having a uniform thickness all the way. And we'll play more with that as we get closer. So I'm going to reestablish a, a little alcove here in the center. And what that means is I'm swinging the handle. I'm not just going straight in. I've got to get something in the center to shoot for. So I'll go another little ways in. All right, that should do it for now. Now I'm going to go straight in multiple times and clean out some more. I usually leave rings in the bottom because that way I don't have to worry about the, the, the entry cut in the future. I just go to wherever it was the last time and I've, I'm there. I was teaching my grandson to turn. There's a bowl over here he hasn't finished yet. And I look at that and the precision of his rings in the bottom. They're exactly a quarter inch all the way out. He's just anal about it, I guess. Saves you a little time and trauma if you don't have to keep making those empty cuts.
starting to feel the overhang a little bit on this half inch gouge. I usually use the 5 8 until I'm ready for a finish cut. But, start paying attention to this wall thickness. If I'm just doing these, a lot of times I just use my finger. I think I'm getting a little thinner in there than here. There's various of these calipers you can get. I like this Tompkins. It's got little brass things that don't scratch the wood. So when you're making measurements on a finished piece, it's pretty forgiving. And you can tell by what's sticking out here. So right now I've got just about just a hair under an inch there as I'm going in it's getting smaller so I get down to that's three quarters in it yeah, and then right at the very bottom I'm back up a little over an inch now another way to tell about your depth I like to just keep this rule here. Some people got some elaborate measuring contraptions. I stick it into whatever I judge to be the deepest part. And then I sight from this edge to the to the back edge. When they're parallel, I know that right now is just, uh, just a little less than four centimeters deep. I look out here for the total depth, not counting the tenon is six and a half. Okay, so in inches, I'm looking to end up with about two down there. So two, two out of six and a half should be going in four and a half. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting there. Ah. Fat boy's lifesaver. Okay, those trips to the ground are not fun. All right, what am I going to do? I'm going to take a little off the outside. What am I doing for speed? I get a little... finish this one with the 40-40 uh, bowl gouge but generally once you're getting into the bottom third of the bowl often in a deeper bowl it's going to start interfering with the edge and you're not going to have 40 degrees to be able to glide that bevel plus you're getting into that alternating grain that's all very long you know if you think about sharpening a pencil so for your amazement and amusement, I'm going to bring in a bottom gouge. Now this is a three-quarter inch bottom gouge. You don't generally put the tool rest in. You can keep it out here flat or nearly flat. You're going to rest this on there and you're going to overhang away. So the three-quarters is you want rigidity. Because I'll be taking this same thing in eight or ten inches sometimes to the bottom of a bowl. I'm cutting here with a 60 degree edge rather than 40, and I'm gonna let it be the thing that's riding in there. Now I've left myself a bunch of junk, so I may be a little rickety cleaning it up. You'll also notice that the flutes are not sharp. I've got on tools like this, these flutes are so sharp, and sometimes I feel like I want a glove so I don't cut myself. I could probably sharpen a pencil on the side of this puppy. This is a one-way uh, 
uh, parabolic. But with this one, I'm never getting out into that flute area. So right now I'm at just, just about 90 degrees across, which leaves these sharp little points out, which I don't want to let get into the wood. And then the bevel is at 60 degrees, which means that if I'm 30 here, that's 60 degrees against the bottom of the bowl. And so now I'm cutting this way, whereas before I was cutting with the flute this way and trying to keep it in the sense of direction. Now I'm going to do this other. Wish me luck. I've not mastered this tool yet. The same principle applies. You want to be controlling with your right hand only or whatever, whichever hand you've got on the handle back here. And at 60 degrees, it's not quite as forgiving as a 40. So I end up a lot of chatter and I could probably use some tips from a pro on how to best do this. temptation to hold it here and turn this into a fulcrum and that's something you don't really want to do. just right. I can still do it with one hand, but I'm a little more cautious. And of course, anytime you get near that nub, it starts getting kind of nubby. All right, now I'm going to try to get this last ridge. Three quarters, three quarters, three quarters, three quarters. Remember, I got the tenon on the back there, so in terms of thickness, that's going to retard moisture going out the bottom quite a little bit. There's one more cut here. Stop. All right, we're pretty close. The tool I use more than I should probably is a negative rake scraper. Huh? <laughs> And in the case of this, it doesn't really need much because it's, this is just first turn. You can see how much unevenness I've got in the bottom. You don't want to take much material off with a negative rake. I probably should put the tool rest inside the bowl. Yeah. Well, with a regular scraper, I'd be crying. With this, not so much. I think that's an okay surface, right down in the middle there. Yeah. But I still try to have a, a decent surface finish, just so it's not changing the drying properties in one part of the bowl. 
Okay, now as Gary or somebody mentioned earlier, these two outer edges need to get rounded. I generally do that with the negative rake. Because they're going to act a little bit like that chip in your windshield, and they're going to allow air to come out that point. It doesn't have to be a lot, but you don't want to leave those round edges. And then on the inside, I don't like the tool rest or the live centers lying around over here. I end up getting bruised and bent on them, so I take them off. Okay, let's take this guy out of here. Okay, I want to say something, The thing that um, Rick just did is really, really, really important. The radius corners. If you leave sharp corners, it is going to strike the break and really assist the back. Right behind you, Annie. Mm -hmm. All right. I use one of these things. They get looking pretty ugly pretty quick. Okay, I'm going to use free shaver. No, you're okay. I pulled out a full jug. Let's get a partial. You want to do this as soon as possible. If you can't do it immediately, you can throw it in the pile of chips, but let's just go ahead and do it. I use it straight out of the can. up in a little cup that makes it easier. Close her back up. Any old cheap brush is fine. Now, there's different schools of thought. And what I did for years was only cover the end grain. So from out here to here, kind of a there and there, both inside and out and let it dry out the sides. But I found that using this 100% works fine. It still dries reasonably fast and even. So it's just a matter of daubing it on there. Looks just like glue, glue doesn't it? And it acts just like glue. That's one reason I like to use this. If I leave two pieces touching, I may have to take a hammer to get them apart. And you don't want that. They, they do glue together. And this will leave a hard finish. Now it dries clear, so that's nice. You can you can see what's going on with the wood without any question. Oh yeah, this is that's what it is. You know, and the more I listen to Ron, the more I realize that it's a PVA-based product. And I'm paying $20, $21, I think, from Craft Supply for it. Uh, the glue is a lot cheaper, and it's going to come out about the same in the long run. So I, I just haven't gotten around to trying it, but I, I have found when Ron says something, you should listen, because he's usually right. Yeah, I've not had an issue. It'll, it, the, the bevel will bounce around a little when you first start, but it comes off of there pretty quick. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Well, part, yeah, well, partly in this case, I'm dealing with a fruit wood, pear, or pear, yeah, which I know is prone to cracking. And I know that this was only cut in October, and it's just still been in blank form ever since then, so I didn't measure the moisture content, but 
I'm sure it's significant. Did you find me a little piece of wood in there somewhere? Any old piece? Yeah, there we go. I like to just lean it on a piece of wood just to keep it off the mat. Maybe two pieces of wood. Okay, you can touch it. Yeah, I know. I hate being gooey. All right, that one's good. Just want to make sure I don't have any glaring holes. This will dry overnight. In the, mor in the morning, it'll be clear, dry on most of it. Probably where it's touching the wood of the bound, there might be a puddle left. Uh, but it goes pretty fast. I've got a little evaporation pond in my sink, so I don't put too much on down the, the drain. I imagine would be heck like glue down there. We'll just wet it for now. Okay. So we've gone from the half log to the half round log to the first turn bowl. Any questions at this point? You had mentioned uh, Mike Stewart, someone who uh, does videos. What was that name? Daddy. Daddy? Daddy, yeah. Uh, I've got handouts over here on the thickness planer. Uh, and they, one of the handouts is a short PowerPoint on the, on the push cutting method from Batty. It was uh, put together by another uh, uh, AAW subgroup. I forget where. I should have given them credit. And then on the other handout, I've listed some resources. There was a... Um, an article in this month's uh, fundamentals. Now, how many of you are AAW members? Okay, you're the lucky ones. The rest of you ought to seriously consider it. I think it's about 70 bucks a year, but it's got the best resources around. And they put out this woodworking fundamentals book uh, once a quarter. It's available online as a PDF. I just copied off the pages here, and I've given you a reference to it on, on there. We'll probably post a copy, but that's kind of speeding with AAW's copyrights since it's technic technically as members only. That's the best article I have found, and uh, it's, it's listed on your handout. Okay, at this point, we've only got about a half hour left. <clears throat> Give you two choices. One choice is I can take one of these and try to final turn it which is just more of what I just showed you, except trying to take it to a final bowl. Or we can shift gears and look at pieces of wood and see what people think they ought to get out of that piece of wood, looking at the grain and the size and the shape. So I don't think we've got time for both, so I'll yield to the group. So is there anything that you need to do to prepare it to put back on your cup after it's dried? Or, you know? Well, it's probably worth going through that. I think it's worth showing yeah, because I've seen some questions on the forum and stuff, and people say, well, how do you get that to happen? Hopefully I have picked one here that doesn't have any major flaws. It looks good. Huh? Okay. Is that, that was in that article? That's, that's on the grain. Yeah, he's good. I haven't followed him that much. Okay. Oh, this has got a couple of nasty chicks at the bottom. I don't want to throw it off of there. Again, I had the plastic on these only to retard it further at the rim for the first uh, few weeks, so... Okay, did this one the same way you just saw. I did it a lot faster without all the stopping and stopping. It goes pretty quick. This has been since about October when this was done. Okay, I don't know if you can see it from over there. But see how it's high here? 
and low here. This thing has gone down and gone down. The pith of the tree was right across this line here, and that's the way it's going to shrink. The larger the diameter, the more shrinkage. So there it goes. This was a round uh, tenon when I finished it in October. It's not round anymore. If I tried putting this in that chuck, one of these bigger ones, it would not be held right, it would not be centered. So the next step is to use some kind of a jam chuck. Now sometimes I use these, this has got a tenon already on it, so I'm just putting a piece of wood in there and doing this. I've got a whole stack of them up there and in various shapes. You change them as you need them, it's, it's quick and easy. And that would be on the inside. That's one way to do it. We're going to use a little different kind of jam chuck this time. And in either case, we're going to need tailstock support. I'm going to bring this guy back up. Okay, he's here. Okay. I've seen these recommended. I built this, I don't know, a month or two ago. Only used it a time or two. But it's got these two padded edges. I made this for fairly large bowls. For bowls this size and smaller, I would tend to use that other little chuck. But with this, I've got this adapter ring that fits this particular chuck. So if I don't go anywhere. Take this all the way in, come on. So that's all the way down to its smallest, and this sets right onto it. And I tighten it up a little bit. And that hits it at just about the exact sweet spot that the manufacturer recommends. I'm gonna make sure it's on there good. Tighten it up. Unlike the wood, you don't have to do that multiple times to, to get it there. Okay. I want to have a fairly aggressive live center. So I'm going to use this as a standard Powermatic one. And it's got a nice center point as well as a cup if it sinks in deep enough. Okay. I call this piece is misshapen. I'm going to put that ridge in the middle. Yeah, just about in the center in, in there. Now let's get this tail stock a little out of the way. Let's bring this a little farther forward. Come on. So this is why it's important to know where that old center was. Set it right on there. Go ahead and pull that in. Not trap my fingers. Right. Okay. Let's just see what I got. Nice. Enough that's going to stay put. Let me just see what I got here. Not too bad. Yeah. So here's my center reference, and I've got a center where it was centered before. My unevenness is here. It's not hurting anything, and because of this indentation, that's, that's what allows that to happen. So I'll go ahead and wind that on a little tighter. I've still got a pretty thick bottom, so I'm not really in danger of crunching it. And I'm going to a different size chuck. So I'm not only going to get it to round, I'm going to get it to hold that chuck. I'm not looking for it. Use this, I guess. Whoa, a little fast for that. You all recognize what I did wrong there. Since I'm not using that, I'll shut it down. Okay, I'm at about 480, using a, a skew. Some of that hard 
hardness you're hearing is the glue coming off. The glue is more forgiving of a gouge than it is of this skew. And I'm still out around, that's why you're hearing that bumpity bump. Okay, if you can see on the camera, I've taken wood off here and here, but I'm not quite down here. So the thing is still a little bit oval, but that's the process. We're trying to get it to, get it to round. I should probably be using the gouge at this point, but what the heck. Okay, you can also see I've taken a little off here, but the rest is still largely untouched. Again, that's part of that distortion. So the tenon is round, the base not quite. Got a little crack in there. Shouldn't hurt it. All right, because I'm using a smaller chuck, I'm gonna have to take this down about like that. Maybe I'll use the gouge. Since I'm just between pressure centers, I really don't want to be getting very aggressive here. So I'm just trying to get it where I've got a round base to work with and take it off light cuts. surfaces are all pretty much there. So it's pretty much as simple as that. take that down a little. I'm just between centers now, so let me slow it down a little. I just take part of this off, I get the rest. Of it.
I could just use a regular saw easy enough. Come on, this little guy is handy. The sawdust not smoke. I'm only hesitating because it's the only thing holding it here is this. So as soon as this comes off, try to use a regular saw, I would be. And I've got to take that off because the Nova jaws are not deep enough to leave that in there. That would bottom out and I wouldn't be in the right place. Okay. So the tricky part is over. I now have a round base. I'm, I'm kind of back to where I would have been most anyway, I can take this off of here. Come on. Anybody that's interested, Glenn Lucas has a video to make that jam. Uh, it's a neck one video. Uh, very easy to make. There's something else here that Glenn did on his video that I noticed. You used the original point that you had on your uh, rough turn key. Yeah. So when Lucas did his, he measured from the side and his Screw center after warpage had moved them up to four and a half an inch. Really? Is that any relevance at all? Well, if Glenn said it, I'll, I'll take his word for it for sure, and it, it, it could have it. Is that, well, I did what I reason I answered. I did one yesterday, and mine was a bowl about this size, and I was off almost a quarter of an inch. Okay, it's a good point. It changed so much in shape. Well, and you can see this one hadn't changed that much. This has got a little bit oval. We've all seen pieces that were like crotch wood or something that had multiple axes of, for, for the, and they can really get gnarly. I probably should have had one to show you, but. Uh, the one I did was a piece of elm, and that elm was just all wonky. Yeah. It was almost football shape. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there a way you found the new center? I did. I measured the distances. We'll say it was eight and a quarter inches. If I found center, I laid it on the table like this, putting them square against it here. So I measured this distance. And then measured it over the center, made a mark. And I just do. Short point, just see what it is. He might put the tool in the wrong place. What does it go like? Do you have a shoulder? No, you need to do both. You're going to we'll say, this is eight and a quarter. Right. This is seven and three quarters. So you take half the seven and three quarters. Okay. Well, with that, we've done everything that's unique to the second turning. And, and that what's unique is getting to a round tenon or recess, whichever you use it, you can do either. And uh, if you didn't have enough to dust you can only do like a, you can't do a reset pin. It'd be kind of impossible to reset pin when you use an Well, it's difficult because it's not only going to get oval, it's going to change in, in shape a little bit. You can still do it. But, and I r rarely do, I've done it, but uh, I tend to prefer the tenon. Mm -hmm. It's out there where you can see it, and especially if I'm going to core, uh, I use a big tenon because that way I can get more bowls out. And I'm learning to not be so stingy with the wood, because with store-bought wood, sometimes I'll do a you know 70 millimeter tenon that's you know an eighth, maybe three sixteenths deep, trying to trying to keep as much <laughs> of that precious wood, and you can get in trouble. I've spit a couple of them off of there. If I'm doing something like this, I'm, I'm at least uh, three eighths deep and more often half or more. You saw the size of those. Now, if I were going to finish this now, uh, the first thing I would do is I'd cut a recess on the inside. Because as a push cutter, 
I don't really want to finish my outside over here next to this. I'm messing around. I can't get past the, the headstock. Okay, so it would only take a minute to, to make a recess, same 100 millimeter, flip it around, hold it there. I don't want to do that while it's on the jam chuck. There's just not enough grip. And so uh, I only recently learned that. That's something I saw in a batty video recently. It says, you know, and he's very economic with his time. He's, he wants to get done fast. And he says it's still better to do that. So I would put that in here, turn it around, finish the outside, just like I would always finish the outside on any bowl first. I shouldn't say always because there's always an exception, but and then turn it back to this tenon and do the inside and we'd be done. But rather than put you through that, why don't we take a few minutes and look, and we'll take a few questions here, make sure we've got all this in your minds, and then let's take a look at some wood and see what people recommend doing with it. Any came across some she'd like to show, and I think that'd be great. Question for you, do you leave the tenon on while you're doing the finishing process, or you take the tenon off and finish it off the leg? I put the finished surface on the outside before I turn it around, except for the tenon. The tenon's still there. I will get this outside. I'll get all, this, all the marks off. I'll do whatever sanding I've got to do. I'll get it down to 220, maybe 320. And um, if, before I even turn it around and do the inside. Then I'll do the inside, do the same thing, and finish. So now I've got the bowl finished inside and out, except for the tenon. See a bunch sitting over there. Because I never get around to doing the tenon, but uh, since they're, they're second turn bowls, they're stable, not a big deal. So I, I would, before I go final, well, they, they go over here first, they get, a, get coats of walnut oil until they quit absorbing it, and then I just let them dry and let that cure. Eventually, I'll turn it around, I'll either use a, a jam chuck or a uh, cold, cold jaws or... I invested in a Longworth there, which I've not learned to love yet, but I'll, I'll keep working on it. Or a vacuum chuck. It's just, just whatever the piece is, I want something that's going to hold it with that tenon out here. And I'll very carefully take that off. Uh, I either take it off entirely and leave a recess, or I turn it into a foot. Sometimes you just change that last curve. You know, it just all depends what you're trying to achieve. But then before final finish, i got to let some oil soak into that. I'm not too fussy about it. And then I use the Beal Bowl Buff to bring it up to a shine, and she's done. Other questions? What were the chucks you just mentioned? I know the long one, but you don't like it. I don't know why you don't like it. Because <laughs> I'm not smart enough to use it. Where'd it go? I got money with me. Do you? Oh, here it is, yeah. I haven't had it long enough for it to get a home, so it's one of these orphan tools around the shop. <laughs> yeah. The nice thing with a Longworth is you're not taking every one of these pegs out every time and move them, so they'll adjust. Uh, I haven't quite gotten the hang, and I've spit a couple of bowls out of it, but that doesn't mean it's not a good tool. You're stock up to it when you're doing it? Yeah. When, when, when possible. Usually everything except that last little nub. And sometimes I take that last nub off other I'll ways. That with mine, and then what I'll do is I'll use full cuts on that, because I know with push cuts, I've had a tendency to pop it off like you did. Okay, yeah, you're putting a lot more torque on it that way. Full cut yeah. and real fine cut. So sheer, sheer like scrape it, it off. And it seems like it takes forever to get it yeah. off. And then I mentioned the cold jaws. These are just on a regular chuck. And uh, you've got you know, about an inch plus or minus uh, to adjust it. But if I've, I've saved up 10 or 12 bowls I want to do in their various sizes, I hate sitting here with an Allen wrench taking these in and out and doing it. But, uh, but it gets the job done. The other thing is a vacuum chuck. These come in various sizes. They screw onto the headstock. There's a vacuum adapter that creates a vacuum in this cavity. And that'll just suck a piece right on here. Again, you probably want tailstock support, especially when you're doing the outer uh, diameters 
If it's a very porous wood, like red oak, you may not be able to draw a vacuum. It's pulling enough air through the grain. That you can wrap the shrink wrap on that, and put that here today. There you go. Yeah. The right of piece of uh, the feely mahogany. Yeah. I was looking at the case, and it stuck out my yeah. tongue. It was fine, and I realized when I took my air tuck and blew it off, but I'm watching the air go through the inside of it. Yeah. So I wrapped it with plastic. Yeah. I found some tip online. Get this tacket stuff. It's uh, used by the arts and crafts people. And it stays a little bit tacky. It's kind of like a white glue that doesn't completely dry. And if I use that to hold these rings on, that, that makes them much more airtight. By vacuum checking to another whole thing we could go One through sometimes. One caution with the vacuum chuck. Keep in mind, the larger the diameter, the more suction you have. So if you do something really thin, it can very easily break it. Yeah. Don't ask me, I know that. <laughs> well, if I'm doing something really thin, I would tend to use a jam chuck. Now, this thing here is accidentally thin. It was just a big pine pine bowl. That'd be a late job. Probably. Huh. I've been thinking about making a lampshade out of it. Wow, that is thin. Actually, done. Well, I won't claim too much credit. It's partly by accident, because I was following a Stuart Batty video, and he's always making these puppies as jam chucks. And you can see you can just take a, take a gouge, make a diameter on it. You don't hear by the camera, man. Okay, and then the piece fits right on it. And you can make the outside diameter where you can put a piece of blue tape around it for a little extra security. And what Stuart will point out is that when you do that, in other words, this thing is on here. I don't know, this thing's almost big enough to do this one again. Okay. This guy will behave like a solid piece of wood because you've got the, the whole tension of that. And so to t tell what your thickness is, remember, you've already got the inside done. You're finishing the outside second. It's a little scary. So you can kind of thump on it, see if you've got any left, and then you bring that push cut right around here, and you can get her down thin. Now, Peter Block can tell us a whole lot more about that than I can, but uh, so this one ended up by accident this thin. And so I look at it and say, well, I want to throw it in the wood pile or try to make a lampshade. First, I'm going to figure out how to make a lamp, and then I'll see if it's worth having a shade. So that's the other way. So those are the methods for turning it around. There's probably a few more. Okay. What is it that you use for the jam chunk? The cloth? Water? Efficient? Well, d different things. <clears throat> With this little one I showed you, I tend to take some of this 3M, whatever you call it. It's an abrasive pad and just stick it on there. Just, or sometimes I'll do it just straight on the wood. It just all depends. I just bought some, some uh, rubber felt. Uh, yeah. Felt yeah. Which I used to line through my cabinet. This one I just glued some of that uh, stuff you use for a router. Keeps your pork piece from skidding around the bench top. Just a little half of that. So, but then on, on this one, you're just using the wood. And that's the one that wasn't too intuitive. And uh, I've got two or three of them here in different sizes. These were just some chunks of pine that I didn't think were worthy of finishing into anything, but uh, I can clamp them on there. Mahoney, Mike Mahoney is a friend of Stewart. At least I think he's a friend. They act like it. And at one point, Stuart needed a jam chuck. So he took a piece of fancy burl that was lying there. It was one of Mike's projects that had been first turned. Stuart clamps in the lathe, takes his thing, starts making grooves in it. And Mahoney's about having a canary because, wait a minute, that's a $500 piece of wood. What are you doing? Don't worry, I won't take much. And he just used <laughs> So he'd use one work piece to, or in progress to make another. And by using mics, it was even sweeter. Okay. Other questions on this? I don't mind if we run a little late. We're, we're right there. We've got some wood on the table saw over there.
I think I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, that's probably a good idea. This is going to get kind of random. <clears throat>